Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the solved case case of 21 year old Rebecca Schaefer. We all have celebrity idols, people in the public eye that we look up to and love, but this case highlights what can happen when someone's admiration for a famous person can escalate into an unhealthy obsession with them, and how that obsession can take an extremely dark turn. Rebecca Schaefer was a rising Hollywood star in the 1980s who had so many dreams and ambitions when it came to her acting career. However, they were dreams that she would never get to accomplish because of an obsessed fan who convinced himself that Rebecca was his and if he couldn't have her, then no one could. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a massive thank you to Acorn TV for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now, if you feel like you have binged and watched every single show on every single streaming service and there's just nothing left to watch, then you definitely need Acorn TV in your life. Acorn TV is the biggest commercial-free British streaming service that offers a huge range of TV programs from around the world, many of which you won't find anywhere else. They have exclusive premieres, compelling stories, and even originals across so many different genres, such as comedy, drama, mysteries, and so much more. There's thousands of hours of binge-worthy content for you to enjoy, with new shows being added every single Monday. My personal favorite category on Acorn TV is their crime section, which I'm sure is no surprise to anyone. A couple of my favorite favorite titles in the crime category include The Secret, which stars James Nesbitt and Genevieve O'Reilly. It's a series that is actually based on a true story, on a real true crime case, where two lovers decide to murder their spouses and then cover up the crime so that they can be together. It's such an interesting case and the series is so gripping and so well done, I really recommend it. Keeping Faith is also available on Acorn TV, Line of Duty is on there as well and also The Golf which I've just recently started watching and I'm loving it so far. It's a psychological mystery drama based in New Zealand and it's about a woman, a detective named Jess Savage who is trying to recover from a car crash that caused the death of her husband when she finds out about a new lead in a cold crime case and so she starts investigating it. She restarts the investigation but lapses in her memory start to make the search for answers even more difficult. I'm still watching season one of The Golf right now, but I'm already looking forward to watching season two, which premieres on the 22nd of November. There are honestly so many good things to watch on the crime section, but as I said, there are several other genres to choose from on Acorn TV if you would prefer to watch something a little bit more lighthearted. And it works on so many different devices. You can either download the app or you can watch online via Apple and Android devices, Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, Roku and even more. With Acorn TV there's always something new to discover so if you would like to try it for free for 30 days then you can go to acorn.tv and use my code which is molly and after the free trial is only about $5.99 a month so a right bargain in my opinion. Just to let you know, my code Molly does have to be in all lowercase letters, otherwise it will not work at checkout. Once again, a huge thank you to Acorn TV for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel, and now let's just get into the case.
So our case today begins in Eugene, which is a city in the state of Oregon in the US. That is where Rebecca Lucille Schaefer was born on the 6th of November 1967. Rebecca's parents are called Benson and Dana Schaefer. Benson worked as a doctor, he was actually a child psychologist, and Dana worked as a writer and a teacher. And together they had just one child, which was obviously their daughter, Rebecca, who they just absolutely Absolutely adored. Benson Schaefer said that both he and his wife were always incredibly close to their daughter Rebecca and that Rebecca was actually a very easy child to parent. Benson and Dana Schaefer always instilled in Rebecca that if she wanted to do anything or achieve anything, no matter what it was, she could do it if she put her mind to it. And I really think that that was something that Rebecca carried with her through the rest of her life. She was always a very determined person. Rebecca did horse riding as a child. She worked hard in school and she had a lot of friends in school. She was a larger than life kind of person. One of her school friends said that Rebecca was like small on the outside as in she was always quite a short and petite girl but her personality was a huge contrast to this. She was big in terms of personality. Rebecca lived in Eugene for the majority of her childhood. However in 19 80, when she was around 12, 13 years old, the family relocated to Portland in Oregon, which is roughly just under two hours away. From what I can gather, they settled in well in Portland. Rebecca obviously started at a new school. She attended Lincoln High School and she was very popular amongst her peers. And it was during her teenage years that Rebecca developed an interest in acting and in the performing arts. Well, I think she had always been interested in that sort of thing from a very early age but in her early teens was when it was pretty much all she could think about. Initially when Rebecca used to think about her future and what she wanted to do with her life career-wise she always said that she wanted to be a rabbi because she was raised in the Jewish faith and she was very devoted to her religion. However as she grew older she changed her mind on what she wanted to be when she grew up. She realised that her main dream, her main goal in life was to become an actress. But before Rebecca pursued that, she decided to try her hand at modelling after a couple of people in her life said that they thought she would be good at it because she was just such a beautiful young girl. Rebecca was 14 years old when she signed on to a talent agency in Portland and it wasn't long before she started receiving job offers. She did some work for a department store catalogue where she would be photographed in school outfits around that time of year when children were getting ready to go back to school and she also did the old TV commercial here and there however Rebecca wanted to do more she had gotten a taste of what it was like to be in the kind of entertainment industry and she loved it and she wanted to progress in that field and so to do that she decided to make a huge life change and she decided that she was going to move to New York City where she knew that there would be a lot more job offers and a lot more opportunities for her and she was just 16 years old when she made this decision and she was going on her own so I imagine it must have been very very scary for her but as I said previously she was such a determined and focused young girl and she was willing to do anything in order to achieve her dream and so she took the plunge and she moved to the Big Apple. She lived in a shared apartment and she got a job working as a waitress to fund her living there which she was hoping would just be a temporary thing, the waitress job, until she landed her first acting role. She got a couple of modelling jobs here and there in New York although I think this was a bit of a struggle for her to get modeling jobs because she was quite short and obviously most models are usually very tall so she wasn't having too much success with that. She did actually move to Japan at one point just for a short while to see if she would have better luck with modeling over there but she soon returned to New York where she still managed to get the occasional modeling job and alongside this she was also going to as many acting auditions 
auditions as she possibly could and eventually she landed a role. She got a part in an American soap opera called One Life to Live and she was cast to play the role of a girl called Annie Barnes and she absolutely loved it. Acting was her main passion in life, her number one dream and she was finally turning that dream into a reality. Rebecca was on One Life to Live for about six months and then following this she landed a part in a comedy film called Radio Days which was directed by Woody Allen. Although according to sources Rebecca's scenes were actually cut out of the film by the time it was released and I'm not entirely sure why they were cut but apparently her character only appears briefly in one scene. But in the end I don't think this mattered too much because it wasn't long after this when 18 year old Rebecca Schaefer received her big break. She auditioned for a new comedy sitcom called My Sister Sam which basically follows the lives of two sisters named Samantha and Patty Russell who live in San Francisco and Rebecca auditioned for the role of the younger sister Patty and she was successful. She got the part of Patty Russell and she played alongside Pam Dorber who was cast as Patty's older sister Samantha. Pam was actually cast in My Sister Sam before Rebecca was and she says that it took them quite a long time to find someone to play Patty. They auditioned countless young women trying to find someone to fill the role but no one seemed to be the right fit until Rebecca Schaefer walked into that audition room and she completely blew them away. Pam says that they just knew instantly after her audition that Rebecca was the one. I've actually watched a couple of clips on YouTube of Rebecca in My Sister Sam and I'll try and play some for you guys if I can but she was really really good in that role. She's sweet and funny and she just plays the part incredibly well. Hi I'm Patty Russell and this is my sister Sam. I just moved in. We haven't lived together since we were kids. I was raised by our aunt and uncle. Yeah things sure have changed. I used to dress her. I can't wear this out in public. This makes up for the haircut you gave me when I was three. <laughs> Brandon? No. I'm in a big hurry. <laughs> Here's the album I was telling you about. Scum Puppies. Live. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Yeah. <gasps> Isn't he great? I can't believe he was actually in my house. Exactly my feeling. <laughs> Who was that? Brandon. The coolest guy in the school. He actually borrowed a record from me. Why didn't you say hello? Are you kidding? You might have sat down. <laughs> Sam, Brandon is intelligent and sensitive and artistic. He wears a metal glove. <laughs> you don't even know him. You're judging him by his looks. Sam, I know you think he's kind of strange looking, but some of your dates have been pretty strange, too. Remember Todd? <laughs> He was wearing penny loafers, and his socks matched his crew neck, and he had this belt with his initials on it, and a tie with little ducks on it, and I had to sit in my own house and watch this guy for over three hours, and okay, all right, I got the line. As part of her new role in My Sister Sam, Rebecca had to relocate to Los Angeles because that was where the show was being filmed and in all honesty she wasn't too happy about this move because she absolutely loved living in New York. That felt like home to her now I think. But she moved anyway of course and she soon settled in in LA when she started filming the sitcom because she got along really really well with the rest of the cast and the crew on the set of My Sister Sam. Sam. In fact everyone on My Sister Sam just felt like Rebecca's extended family. They all loved each other and loved working together so much. My Sister Sam had a spot on prime time television and as soon as it was released in October of 1986 it was a hit. It was ranked as one of the top 25 shows on TV at the time. It had really, really high ratings and thousands of viewers. And
and it was following all of this that Rebecca Schaefer started becoming pretty well known. She was becoming famous and her fame only grew when a couple of months after the first episode of My Sister Sam aired, Rebecca was on the front cover of Seventeen magazine in March of 1987 and she was also on the cover of the TV Guide magazine alongside Pam Dorber, her co-star. Rebecca did television interviews. She actually did an interview with CBS Morning News in which they talked about My Sister Sam. She was doing so incredibly well for herself and she was really becoming like a household name. Pretty much everyone knew who Rebecca Schaefer was. But despite that, Rebecca was still a very humble young woman. I don't think she really cared about the fame. She wasn't doing all of this because she wanted to be a celebrity. She just wanted to be a successful actress and do what she loved every day and the fame had just become a part of that. At the age of 19, Rebecca started dating a 23-year-old film student named Brad Silberling, who is now a very successful film director. And they quickly developed a serious relationship. They were very committed to one another and they were together right up until Rebecca's death, I believe. Now, the first season of My Sister Sam did incredibly well. As I said, it was on primetime TV. It had a lot of viewers and really high ratings. However, when the second season was released, ratings dropped and they dropped quite a bit and so unfortunately the show was cancelled halfway through season two it was just taken off the telly in April of 1988 which I'm sure was very disappointing and upsetting for Rebecca because she really enjoyed playing the part of Patty Russell and she adored the cast and the crew she loved every single person that she worked with on that show but she kept going she carried on or Auditioning for different acting jobs and she landed a part in a couple of different films including The End of Innocence, Out of Time and Voyage of Terror. I don't think she was like the main character in these films, I think she had more of a supporting role in each of them but they were still progressing her acting career and I guess keeping her in the public eye. And as part of this relatively new fame that she had, Rebecca developed a fan base. So many people had loved watching her her play her movie and TV roles, especially the role of Patty Russell in My Sister Sam. She made them laugh every week when that show was on air and they admired her so much. They were big fans. And these fans started sending her some gifts and fan mail, which Rebecca was just completely over the moon about and shocked about. She couldn't believe that there were people out there that had taken the time to write her lovely letters and cards. And she was was so grateful and she wanted to respond to literally every single letter that she received telling her fans how grateful she was to have their support and so that's exactly what she started doing. She started writing back to a lot of the people that had written to her although she was actually advised not to do this by a few people in her life I believe. They told her that she needed to be careful and that she shouldn't really respond to fan mail because some fans might misinterpret this in a way. They said that the most she should really do is just send them back a signed photo, like a signed headshot, but that's it. Of course, the majority of fans would be over the moon and just so, so happy to receive a letter back from their idol. However, the concern with this is that some could mistake this as almost like an invitation into a celebrity's life, if that makes sense. Like they might think, oh, they wrote back to me. They must want to get to know me. They must want me in their life. I don't know if I'm wording this in the right way, but basically some fans can get a bit too obsessed with their favourite celebrity. And if that celebrity kind of communicates with them like Rebecca was with her letters, that's when the obsession can just grow and intensify even more. To the point where it can be dangerous, to the point where the fans think that they have some kind of special 
special relationship with their idol and they want to know everything there is to know about them. Things that they really shouldn't know like their phone number and their home address and unfortunately that is exactly what happened to Rebecca Schaefer. One day she wrote back to a fan and this fan misinterpreted her response and started taking their interest and obsession with her way too far. This fan was called Robert John Bardo and he was originally from the city of Tucson which is in Arizona in the US. So just for a bit of background information about him, he was born on the 2nd of January 1970 which means he would have been about 19 years old at the time that this case took place in 1989. His father was a man named Philip and he worked in the United States Air Force and unfortunately I couldn't actually find the name of his mother anywhere but I do know that she was originally from Japan. Robert was one of seven children and he was the youngest child so he was the baby of the family and his childhood was really not a very nice one. The Bardo family moved around constantly, they never really stayed in one place for long and I believe this was due to the nature of Philip Bardo's job being in the Air Force. So there really wasn't any stability for the Bardo children until 1983 when they finally settled down in Tucson in Arizona. It's stated on a couple of sources online that Robert was abused and neglected throughout his childhood years and not just by his parents but also by his older siblings and one sibling in particular, I believe it was one of his older brothers, was particularly horrible and abusive to Robert which resulted in Robert having a lot of issues with his mental health and to make matters worse he didn't really have a good school life either. He had zero friends, he was a loner, he had no one that he could really talk to about anything. Although he did try to, one article I read stated that he used to write letters to his teachers which were basically like cries for help and in one of them he even said that he wanted to end his life and commit suicide. So following this he was offered a few counselling sessions and it was also around this time that his family actually placed him in foster care and I don't know why, I don't know if it was just him that was placed in foster to care or all of his siblings but he wasn't there for very long anyway before Robert was admitted to a psychiatric hospital in 1985 due to his mental health problems and it was following this that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. After he left the hospital he dropped out of school at around 15 years old despite being a very bright young man he was actually quite intelligent but he dropped out regardless and he got a job working as a janitor at a restaurant on. However, over the next few years, he would become involved with the police quite a lot. He was arrested a couple of times due to domestic violence, disorderly conduct and antisocial behaviour. Although from what I can gather, he was never sent to prison for any of these. He never served prison time. A lot of people that knew Robert Bardo just thought that he was a ticking time bomb. They said that he was a time bomb on the verge of exploding. He could be very violent and threatening. He threatened a lot of people including some of his neighbours. He often displayed very erratic and alarming behaviour and this only developed when he started becoming a little too obsessed with a couple of female celebrities, one of which was Rebecca Schaefer. However, before Bardo became obsessed with Rebecca Schaefer, he was obsessed with another woman, or child I should say, because she was just 10 years old when she shot to fame and Bardo was a couple of years older than her. Her name was Samantha Smith. She was an American schoolgirl and a peace activist who became famous in the US after she wrote a letter to Soviet leader Yuri Antropov. And in this letter she expressed her concerns about America and Russia getting into a nuclear war due to the tense relations between the two countries at the time in the 80s during the Cold War. And as soon as Robert Bardo heard about Samantha Smith, he became fixated with her. He practically fell in love with her even though he didn't know her and she was just 10 years old but he decided that he loved her and he was going 
to find her. He decided that he was going to travel all the way to the state of Maine, which is where Samantha lived with her family at the time. He actually stole some money from his mother to buy a bus ticket, but before he even got to Maine, the police found him and he was sent back home to his parents. And Bardo would not get the chance to try and find her again, because when Samantha Smith was just 13 years old, her life was tragically cut short when she died in an airplane crash with her father. So that ended Bardo's obsession with Samantha Smith. However, it was not long after this that another female in the public eye caught his attention, and that was Rebecca Schaefer. The first time Robert Bardo ever saw Rebecca Schaefer was in mid-1986, when he was around 16 years old, and he saw a trailer on the television which was advertising a new comedy sitcom called My Sister Sam. He later said, quote, back in the summer of 1986 when I was watching TV shows like Magnum P.I., the commercial for My Sister Sam came on and that's when I first saw her. That's what got me curious about her and then I'd watched the show and she's very outgoing and bubbly and everything. And the more Bardo watched Rebecca in My Sister Sam, the more interested in her he became. He thought Rebecca was this beautiful, kind, innocent young girl and very quickly this interest developed into an obsession. He was obsessed with Rebecca Schaefer. I've got another quote here from Bardo and he said, she came into my life in the right moment. She was brilliant, pretty, outrageous. Her innocence impressed me. She turned into a goddess for me, an idol. Since then, I turned into an atheist. I only adored her. As a lot of her other fans did, Robert Bardo wrote a letter to Rebecca. He wrote several letters to her actually in which he just told her how much he loved her, how he thought she was an incredible actress, how he loved watching her in My Sister Sam, stuff like that. And the more he wrote to her, the more his feelings for her grew and intensified. And to Robert Bardo's absolute delight, Rebecca replied to one of his letters, despite people around her telling her that she shouldn't really reply to fan mail. But as I mentioned earlier, Rebecca was just such a kind and caring person and she wanted to show her appreciation to the fans that had sent her letters by sending one back and that's exactly what she did to Robert Bardo. She replied to one of his letters saying quote, yours was one of the nicest I ever got and as soon as Bardo read those words he was absolutely over the moon. As I said he had sent her so many letters by this point and with each one he wrote his feelings for her were just getting stronger and stronger and stronger and he wanted to be with her. He was in love with this woman and when he received that response, yours was one of the nicest I ever got, he convinced himself that she must have felt the same way about him. She must have liked him too. And so he decided that he needed to find her. He needed to meet Rebecca in person. In the summer of 1987, 17-year-old Robert Bardo boarded a plane which took him to the Burbank Airport in Los Angeles. And from there, he got in a taxi which took him to the Warner Brothers studios where Rebecca was filming My Sister Sam. It was still on TV at this time. He went to the studios, he had a teddy bear in one hand and a bunch of flowers in the other, which he intended to give to Rebecca. However, he encountered a problem when he arrived because the security obviously refused to let him in. When he approached the security guards outside, Bardo lied to them and he told them that he was a friend of Rebecca's. He said that he had come to see her and that this visit, his visit, had been pre-arranged. He claimed that Rebecca knew who he was and she knew that he was coming to see her that day. However, when the security rang Rebecca while she was inside the studio and they told her this, she of course had no idea what they were talking about. She had no idea who Robert Bardo was and she hadn't arranged to see him that day, so she didn't come down. And so Robert Bardo was told that he couldn't see Rebecca 
and that he needed to leave which he did however he was not going to give up that easy and about a month later he returned to the Warner Brothers studios again determined to see Rebecca Schaefer however this time he was armed with a knife he brought a knife with him so I'm guessing he was intending to threaten the security guards with it so that they would let him onto the set although I don't believe he did actually use this knife and just like the first time of course he was told to leave and told that he wasn't allowed to see Rebecca and once again he was very frustrated and very angry about this and he actually wrote in his diary quote I don't lose period but despite this Bardo's feelings for Rebecca remained he was still in love with her I think he would still write her letters and he would always follow her acting career watching every TV show and movie that she was cast in. Now the majority of the characters that Rebecca played were very young and sweet and innocent kind of typical girl next door vibes just like the role that made her famous Patty Russell in My Sister Sam. People became very used to seeing Rebecca in those kinds of roles or at least that was until June of 1989 when a new film called Scenes from the Class Struggle of Beverly Hills was released. In the film Rebecca played a character called Zandra and she had a sex scene with one of her male co-stars which she had never done before. She had never filmed a sex scene and when Robert Bardo watched this film and he watched the sex scene he was absolutely furious. He was disgusted at Rebecca for this because as we discussed a minute ago she had always played the roles of these sweet pure innocent young girls young women and her role in this film the Beverly Hills film was a big contrast to that and Robert Bardo hated that and I also think that he viewed the sex scene as Rebecca cheating on him in a way because he had convinced himself by this point he had convinced himself in his brain that she had the same feelings for him as he had for her. It was like he convinced himself that they were actually in a real relationship and she had now been unfaithful to him because of this sex scene. He was so so angry at Rebecca and he decided that he was going to get revenge on her for this. She needed to be punished but I think a part of him finally realised at this point that he was never going to get Rebecca and he wrote in his diary quote I have an obsession with the unattainable and I need to destroy what I cannot attain. Robert Bardo decided that he was going to confront Rebecca at her home but of course before he could do that he needed to find out her address and to do this he hired a private investigator and he paid them $300 to find out where she lived and he actually got this idea to hire a private investigator from an article that he read once in People magazine and this article was about a man named Arthur Jackson who had stalked an American actress called Teresa Saldana who had been in films such as The Raising Bull and Defiance. After Arthur Jackson watched Teresa in these films he quickly developed an obsession with her just like Robert Bardo had now done with Rebecca Schaefer and Jackson wanted Teresa. He wanted her to be his and so he hired a private investigator to find out her home address. However all this investigator could actually find was Teresa's mother telephone number and so Jackson came up with a plan. Jackson rang Teresa's mother and he pretended to her that he was Martin Scorsese's, the very famous film director, he pretended that he was Scorsese's assistant and that he had a script for Teresa that he needed to send her so he asked if he could have her daughter's address and it worked. Teresa's mother genuinely believed that this was Martin Scorsese's assistant and so she told Arthur Jackson where Teresa lived. In March of 1982 after he had obtained the address Jackson went straight to Teresa's home 
and for some reason he decided to attack her with a knife. He stabbed Teresa repeatedly over and over again, I think just in the middle of the street outside of her home, and thankfully a passerby named Jeff saw the attack, he heard Teresa's screams, and he grabbed Arthur Jackson and wrestled him to the ground. Teresa was rushed to the hospital, and luckily, despite her extensive injuries, she did survive the attack. And I believe she actually went on to make a film about the attack and what happened to her and as I said when Robert Bardo read about this in People magazine and he read about how Arthur Jackson had used a private investigator to get Teresa's address he was inspired and he decided to do the same. He hired a PI, he paid them $300 and they set out to find Rebecca's address. Of course he didn't tell the PI the real reason that he wanted it, he just told them that Rebecca was an old friend of his and that he wanted her current address because he wanted to send her a present that he had bought for her. And they believed him and were very quickly able to obtain Rebecca Schaefer's home address address by going through the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles in California, because driving license information was actually public record at the time, and obviously your address is on your driving license. The private investigator found out through the DMV that at this time in 1989, Rebecca was living in an apartment on Sweetser Avenue in West Hollywood in California, and now that Robert knew where she lived, he went straight there. In July of 1989, 19-year-old Robert John Bardo got on an overnight bus which took him to LA and he was actually armed with a gun. You see, whilst he was waiting for the private investigator to find out Rebecca's address, Bardo had attempted to buy a handgun from a shop in Tucson in Arizona. However, the shop owner refused to sell to him because Bardo openly admitted that he had a history of mental health issues and so Robert asked one of his older brothers named Edward to go into the gun shop and buy the gun for him saying that he wanted to use it for target practice and his brother agreed he bought the handgun gave it to Robert and then Robert took it with him on his trip to LA. When Robert arrived in Rebecca's neighborhood on the morning of the 18th of July he actually walked around for a little bit and he just asked the local people, anyone that he came across on the street, where Rebecca Schaefer lived, just so that he could be sure that this was her hometown and that this was her address. He was showing people a picture that he had of Rebecca in his pocket and just asking them if she lived around here and I think most people just ignored him and walked away. But when he felt certain that this was her address, he walked up to her apartment door and he rang the doorbell. Now Rebecca was at home at the time and she was actually expecting a visitor that day. She was waiting for a courier to deliver a script for the film The Godfather Part 3 because she was due to be auditioning for a part in that movie and she was really excited about it, really looking forward to it. However, it was an audition that she would never actually get to attend. So when her doorbell rang that day, she just assumed that it was her script being delivered but of course it wasn't. At her front door was the man who had been stalking her for years, Robert John Bardo. Although of course to her this was just a complete stranger, she had no idea who he was, she had no idea just how obsessed this man was with her. When she opened the door Bardo told Rebecca that he was her biggest fan, he said that he loved watching her on TV and he actually pulled out of his bag the letter that he had written her and the signed photograph that she had sent him years earlier. And Rebecca was kind and polite and she had a short conversation with Bardo, however I imagine this encounter must have made her feel very uncomfortable, the fact that this fan knew her address and had just shown up at her home. So she spoke to him briefly but she quickly excused herself, she said that she had to go because she was busy preparing for an audition, so she should Bardo's 
hand. She told him to take care and then she shut the door. And some sources online even state that before she shut the door, she kindly asked Robert Bardo not to come back, not to return. And Robert Bardo was really angry about this encounter. He had always imagined in his head that his first time meeting Rebecca would be magical. They would get along really well and she would fall in love with him on the spot but of course it didn't happen like that. He was so annoyed that she spoke to him for like a few minutes, if that, and then pretty much shut the door in his face. This wasn't how it was supposed to go in his mind. He was quite shocked, to be honest, but he didn't react straight away. He actually went to a restaurant, a diner nearby, and he ordered some food there. He ate his food, and then he went into the bathroom. And in the bathroom, he checked that his hand gun was loaded. He then rang his sister from a payphone and he said something along the lines of, you're going to hear something about me in the news soon. And according to some sources, he also told her that he was just a few blocks away from Rebecca Schaefer's home. He was incredibly vague in this phone call. He didn't expand on this really, but his sister was very concerned because he had recently written a letter to her in which he said the same thing that he had previously written in his diary. He said, quote, I have an obsession with the unattainable. I have to eliminate what I cannot attain. He didn't specifically mention Rebecca Schaefer in the letter, but I believe his sister knew that he had a bit of an obsession with her and she knew what her brother was like as a person. She knew that he had mental health issues and so she was worried about what he was on about what he was going to do and so she told him to come back home on this phone call but Bardo didn't go back home instead he went back to Rebecca Schaefer's address to confront her he rang her doorbell and once again Rebecca was expecting it to be the delivery of her script so she was very annoyed when she answered the door and found that it was the same guy that she had dismissed earlier on that morning the guy that she had told she was very busy so this time Rebecca wasn't as polite and Bardo claimed that she told him that he was wasting her time and he said that she was suddenly very cold and rude towards him which I just want to say we don't know if that is true this is just what Robert Bardo claims but I mean even if she was rude towards him I think she had every right to be just because she was well known doesn't mean it's acceptable for this stranger to violate her privacy and show up at her door especially after she dismissed him the first time that he knocked but Bardo says that when Rebecca told him that he was wasting her time, something inside of him just snapped. He was furious and so he said to her, quote, I forgot to give you something. And after he said this, he grabbed his handgun, he pointed it at Rebecca and shot her once in the chest at point blank range and Rebecca fell to the ground. As soon as he shot Rebecca, Bardo says that he did consider killing himself in that moment too. He thought about shooting shooting himself in the head and falling on top of her, kind of like a Romeo and Juliet kind of thing, like together in death. But in the end, he didn't. He just watched Rebecca for a few moments. He watched her fall to the ground, bleeding out, and he said nothing when she screamed, why, why me? This is a direct quote from Bardo as he was later describing the attack. And he said, she had this kid voice, sounded like a little brat or something, said I was wasting her time, wasting her time. No matter what, I thought that was a very callous thing to say to a fan, you know? I grab the door, guns still in the bag, I grab it by the trigger, I come around and kapow, and she's like screaming, ah, screaming, why, ah, and it's like, oh god. Seconds later, Bardo fled the scene, and a neighbour rushed to Rebecca's side after hearing the gunshot and her screams. This neighbour rang 911, and they stayed with Rebecca until the emergency services arrived. 
arrived at the scene and as soon as the ambulance got there the paramedics took Rebecca straight to the hospital but unfortunately it was too late there was nothing that doctors could do to save her and so about half an hour after she arrived at the hospital Rebecca Schaefer was pronounced dead at just 21 years old. Following her death, the police immediately launched a murder investigation. The hunt was on to find the man that did this to Rebecca. And obviously we know who it was. We know that it was Robert Bardo, but the police at this point in time had absolutely no idea. They had no idea who they were looking for. However, just the next day, the 19th of July, a man was arrested in Tucson, Arizona. And that man was Rebecca's killer. Robert Bardo. Although the reason Bardo was actually found and arrested was because several motorists had rung 911 reporting the fact that a man had just been running in and out of the road constantly. He was just running in front of all of the traffic so it looked like he was purposefully trying to get hit by cars and sources even state that whilst he was doing this he was shouting I killed Rebecca Schaefer. This man was obviously Robert Bardo. So when the police arrived at the scene Bardo was immediately arrested and when the police searched him and searched his pockets they found that in his possession he had a picture of Rebecca Schaefer and of course the police knew that just the day before before Rebecca had been murdered. So they strongly believed that this man they had just arrested was the perpetrator. Eventually Bardo was extradited back to California where he was charged with Rebecca's murder because by this point the police had gathered a lot of evidence linking him to the crime. They'd been told about the obsession that he had had with Schaefer for years and years. They had the photo of Rebecca that Bardo had in his pocket. They had accounts from witnesses who said that they had seen Bardo in Rebecca's neighbourhood on the day of her murder. They also had the accounts from the witnesses who said that Bardo actually approached them and asked if they knew where Rebecca Schaefer lived. The police spoke to Robert Bardo's sister and she told them about how her brother had sent her a really strange letter a few days before the attack and how he rang her on the day that Rebecca died and he was just acting really weird and he said that he was just blocks away from Schaefer's home and in addition to that the police found his gun holster and the yellow shirt that he was wearing that day just dumped on the ground in an alleyway not too far from Rebecca's home so after he shot Rebecca he clearly just discarded those items there in an attempt to get rid of evidence although just a side note I don't know what he did with the actual gun because I don't think it was ever found. It wasn't dumped in the alleyway and it wasn't in his possession when he was arrested. So I don't know if the police ever found it. But like I said, they did find his yellow shirt and the gun holster dumped in the alleyway, although that wasn't actually all that the police found. They also discovered a copy of the book, The Catcher in the Rye, which the police thought was very interesting because this was the exact same book that stalker and obsessed fan Mark David Chapman had in his possession at the time that he shot and killed John Lennon in 1980. So it was like Bardo had taken inspiration from that and decided to do the same, decided to carry the same book with him when he attacked and killed Rebecca. And as well as all of that evidence, they also had a confession. Robert Bardo openly admitted to the police when he was arrested that he was the one who shot Rebecca. Although despite his confession, Bardo actually decided to plead not guilty to his charge, his first degree murder charge. He acknowledged and he admitted that he was the one who killed Rebecca, but his defence team believed that he should only be convicted of second degree murder because they claimed 
mentioned that due to the fact that he was mentally ill, he was incapable of planning such a crime. He was incapable of planning murder. They said that it was just a spur of the moment thing. This anger just suddenly took over him when Rebecca was rude to him on her doorstep. And so without thinking, he grabbed the gun and shot her. Bardo actually claimed in his interviews that the only reason he went back to Rebecca's apartment that second time was because he realised that he had forgotten to give Rebecca a CD and a note that he had written for her. And he said that when she was cold and kind of standoffish towards him, that's when he snapped. Although, as I'm sure you can imagine, a lot of people did not believe this at all. They did not believe that this murder was just a sudden angry spur of the moment thing. Because if this really wasn't pre-planned, then why did Robert Bardo need to take a gun with him to see Rebecca? What else would he have been planning to use it for? It just doesn't make any sense. So because Bardo pleaded not guilty to his first degree murder charge, that meant that the case had to go to trial and the lead prosecutor in the case was none other than Marsha Clark, the woman who would go on to be the lead prosecutor during the infamous trial of OJ Simpson just a couple of years later. Marsha and her team actually wanted there to be a bench trial in this case in Bardo Bardo's case, which basically means that Bardo's fate, his conviction, would be decided by one judge rather than an entire jury. And Bardo and his defence team agreed to this under the condition that if he was found guilty, he would not be given the death penalty as punishment. The death penalty would be taken off the table and the prosecution agreed. Marsha Clark's main task during this trial was to prove to the jury that this murder was premeditated. Like I mentioned, the defence argued that it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been premeditated due to the fact that Bardo was severely mentally ill and suffering from schizophrenia when the crime took place. They claimed that he was just incapable of planning such an attack. So Marsha had to try and prove that it was pre-planned in order for Bardo to receive life in prison without the chance of parole, in order for him to be convicted of first degree murder because that's the main difference between first degree murder and second degree murder. First degree is where the killer planned to do this. They planned to kill whoever they killed whereas second degree is more like what the defence were arguing where Bardo just suddenly snapped. He, it was a spur of the moment thing. He was angry and so he grabbed the gun and shot her in a fit of rage. So during the trial, Marsha Clark talked about his obsession with Rebecca, how he'd been obsessed with her for years and years, how he was in love with her, and when he realised that Rebecca didn't return these feelings, he decided to murder her then. Because in his mind, if he couldn't have her, then no one else could. Marsha talked about how Bardo stopped at nothing to get the handgun that was used to shoot her when the shop owner wouldn't sell it to him due to his history of mental illness. He just got one of his brothers to buy it for him. She talked about the weird phone calls and letters that he had sent to his sister, his diary entries. She went through the witness accounts, the witnesses who saw him in Rebecca's neighbourhood that day and the ones who he spoke to asking where Rebecca lived. But one of the most interesting things that Marsha discussed during the trial was how when she watched the videos of Robert Bardo's interviews after his arrest, she noticed that when he was describing what happened before he shot Rebecca, he had one hand behind his back to show that he was holding the gun behind him. And that further proves that this was premeditated because the gun wasn't just in his bag when Rebecca opened the door the second time, he was holding it behind his back, his finger ready on the trigger. So he knew that he was going to use it before she even answered the door. There was just an overwhelming amount of evidence to say that this crime was planned and the judge, Dino Falgiono, 
agreed. He agreed with the prosecution. And so on the 29th of October 1991, over two years after the crime was committed, Robert John Bardo was convicted of the first degree murder of Rebecca Schaefer. And two months later, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. So he would die behind bars. And so of course, that is still where he remains today. Today, Robert Bardo is around 51 years old and he is serving his sentence at the Aveno State Prison in California. In July of 2007, he was actually attacked in jail. He was stabbed 11 times by another inmate whilst he was on his way to get breakfast. And although his injuries were very severe, he did survive the attack. He made a full recovery in the hospital and then he was sent back to prison. And a very sick twist in this case is that during Bardo's time behind bars, he has drawn a lot of pictures. He draws a lot of pictures of different celebrities such as Michael Jackson, um, Taylor Swift. He's also drawn pictures of serial killers such as John Wayne Gacy and Charles Manson. I think he's drawn David Berkowitz as well. But another person that he's drawn a lot of pictures of is Rebecca Schaefer. He's drawn so many pictures of her whilst he's been in prison. And honestly, when I read that, I was shocked. I cannot believe that, number one, he has the nerve to draw her, and number two, that he's just allowed to do that, that they're allowing him to draw pictures of his murder victim. I think it's disgusting. But anyway, moving on from that, um, ABC News actually made a documentary about this case a few years ago and they reached out to Robert Bardo in prison for a comment and he said, quote, I accept full responsibility for what I've done. My thinking was so negative and I was blaming others for things that was happening within me. But regarding Rebecca Schaefer, you know, she was irreplaceable. I think about about her every day because she should be here. I realise what I've done and I feel a lot of tremendous guilt. I read all the interviews that the Schaefers have done and it helped me understand what I've done and it's just so devastating. I guess I was insecure and frustrated and I took that out on Rebecca. I talk with professionals about this, about trying to explore the reasons why I did what I did. My warped thinking as far as taking in negative thoughts and putting blame on her. You know, I think of all the things that she could have seen today that she didn't get to see and it breaks my heart. But of course, as I'm sure you can imagine, Rebecca's friends and family don't care at all what Robert Bardo has to say. It doesn't make any difference to them that he is feeling guilty and remorseful because that doesn't bring Rebecca back. She can never come back because he decided to take her life that day in 1989. In the aftermath of Rebecca's murder, it was recognised by the authorities that more needed to be done when it came to stalking and keeping celebrities like Rebecca safe. Because technically, in the eyes of the law, what Robert Bardo was doing before he murdered Rebecca, stalking her, that wasn't a crime. There was no law in place at that point that said that people were not allowed to stalk other people, which is insane. And so Rebecca's death was really a wake-up call and it prompted a movement called the anti-stalking movement, which thankfully resulted in several changes in the law. In 1990, a new law was passed in California and this law officially made stalking a criminal offence. And in addition to that, changes were also made when it came to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, in California because, as I said earlier, that was how Bardo's private investigator managed to get Rebecca's address. They just went to the DMV because at that point in time, driving license information was public record, meaning anyone, any person could find out another person's personal information, such as their address, through this. And so in 1994, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act was passed and it was 
passed in every state and this basically prevents the DMV from releasing people's private information and their private addresses and as I said this was all prompted by the murder of Rebecca Schaefer so as heartbreaking and devastating as her death was the Drivers Privacy Protection Act and the anti-stalking law is something positive that came out of it and I'm sure that the anti-stalking law in particular has saved several other lives by this point. But that is it for this video that is the case of actress Rebecca Schaefer. As always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. Also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover. I do have a case request form linked in the description box if you would like to request a case through that. Before I go I do just want to say thank you so much to Acorn TV once again for sponsoring this video. A reminder that if you would like to try Acorn TV for free for 30 days then you can go to acorn.tv and use my code which is molly. Again just be aware that the code does have to be in all lowercase letters otherwise it will not work at checkout. Thank you all so so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!